Hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see me. Hopefully you can hear me. Thank you so much for joining uh, joining us this evening, five o'clock in the UK, or I've no idea what time it is wherever uh, around the world. So I know we've had quite a few people from all over the place sign up, but uh, it's a massive thanks from me to the folks at BenQ and x -Rise because I'll be honest with you, I never thought this day would ever happen, uh, which might sound weird to say that, but we're doing a webinar now with the two words landscape photography in it. And that is something I never, ever thought would happen. Uh, because as a video I did recently, last four weeks or so, I actually called it, I suck uh, landscape photography. Because me being a portrait photographer, I just could not get it. However, we are doing a talk today on landscape photography, my journey, if you like, but also how I compare and also see an overlap with portrait photography and landscape photography because certainly over the last few weeks since i've been getting out there doing what i can within obviously the limitations of all the lockdowns and and where how far we can travel i've had a really steep learning curve and i want to share that with you tonight with a combination of uh, some slides we're going to go through some short videos and there's actually one video in particular which you're going to think is a little bit random it's, it's completely off the wall but it's got relevance or at least I hope you think it has. Uh, but I'm gonna kind of, we're using this go to webinar. This is all very new to me using go to webinar. So if it seems a little bit kind of jumping around a bit, bear with me, you're gonna get to see all the content. Uh, but uh, let me just start off by basically sort of showing you a couple of things. I'm gonna just dive over to my screen now. Uh, I'm gonna show you my uh, keynote and hopefully you can see that. I'll just turn me off. You don't really wanna see me just there. And I'm going to just basically run through, first of all, because obviously what I'm talking about now, the comparison that I see between portrait photography and landscape photography and how that is really helping me to, I'm not going to say get good, but certainly improve. But for those of you who have no idea who I am, just very, very quickly, let me just show you just an example of some of the portraits that I've done over the past few years. And some of these are friends, some are clients, some are just purely things that I've organized to do because I just enjoy getting out there and doing stuff in between hired work. I think it's really important to get out there and always be creative, always be having the camera in your hand, well, as often as you certainly can. But my work has been very varied but it is always based around portrait photography. A lot of, uh, you started out doing a lot of physique work, but I really do enjoy portraits that kind of get the viewer, somebody who's looking at the picture, to feel as if they know the person. Do you know what I mean? Get a feel for who they are. You certainly wouldn't get to feel who this person is because this is a, an action figure. It's actually a toy, uh, but I just enjoy doing it. But these are some of the kind of pictures that I've taken over the years, like I said, um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed doing it. It is definitely my comfort zone. It's kind of what I do as a portrait photographer. However, over the last, I would say, three years, if we kind of think, if we kind of forget about uh, the last 12 months where we've had to deal with restrictions and movement, and lockdown, all that kind of stuff. Before that happened last March, or for the two years leading up to that, my main thing as a portrait photographer was photographing people like you can see on screen now, incredible people, these, these World War II veterans, uh, that's what I was doing. Now, this has been the most, um, uh, what, what can I say really, the most rewarding thing I've ever done as a photographer, most fulfilling thing I've ever done as a photographer. But more than anything, it's also been the biggest learning curve I've ever had in my photography doing this. Now, it's not something that I kind of just like, um, you know, learned from a book, it's actually getting out there and doing stuff, being in the field for want of a better phrase and learning by your mistakes, learning what, uh, how to adapt to an environment and how to get the most out of somebody. But one of the biggest things I've kind of found is that this here, I'll just show you this next picture. This is me when I was photographing a guy called Ken Doxey, World War II veteran who lived in Burton-upon-Trent. Sadly, we've now lost Ken. But looking at this picture here, this, uh, it just sums it up for me, it really does. Hopefully you can see from this picture how me and Ken are getting on. We are completely relaxed in each other's company. We're enjoying each other's company. And this would never have happened if I hadn't changed the way that I do portraits, which also now will link into how I'm doing landscapes, okay? And that is a case of taking the focus off why I was there 
but more a case of immersing myself and enjoying the environment and who I'm with. All right. And you'll, you'll hopefully get to see what I mean, why there's a combination or, or a kind of overlap there with the landscape photography. Now, let me just show you this next picture here, because this is this is where the link comes in, I believe. I'm going to show you this little picture here. This is a behind the scenes picture of when I was photographing a veteran called Reg Charles. And a very just a quick kind of overview of how I now do these portraits is, and this could be me photographing you. If this is the first time we've met, you may not want to have your photo taken because I don't often, if ever, photograph models. These are generally, for want of a better phrase, normal people, <laughs> everyday people that are going to be photographed, which I'll probably guess is what most people will photograph friends, family, and whatever. So how do you photograph these people to get the most out of them? So my process, which again, I'll come to the landscape side of things in a moment. My process for this would have been, or, or is rather, when I first turn up at your house to photograph you, I leave all the kit in the car. So I go into the house, you know, you open the door to me, we go in, we'll have a cup of tea or a coffee, and we just spend time talking about anything and everything, not the photo shoot. More than likely, we won't even talk about that because I want to keep your mind off it because I want you to relax. When we are eventually kind of just really getting on, okay, there's a great conversation. Maybe if we're lucky, there's a bit of laughter going on as well. I then feel that we're, we're about right now. Now we can take a picture. We are relaxed in each other's company. Then I'll go and get the stuff and then we do the picture. And that's made a huge, huge difference to my photography. In fact, now my photography has gone on its head when it comes to portraits because I spend more time talking, chatting, relaxing, finding out about you or the person who else I'm photographing than I do behind the camera. The photo shoot, I don't know, it is 20% maximum of my time when I actually go into a picture. 20% of that time is actually taking the picture. The rest of the time is relaxing immersing myself in the environment and so on and so forth. But let me just kind of go through just a couple more things here because now I want to start to link this in to how we do uh, the landscapes. Here's a couple more pictures you can see of me just with some of these veterans and hopefully you can tell by these. These aren't, they're not forced, these are just relaxed pictures. We've, we've only been able to take these comfortable pictures because we are relaxed with each other. We spent the time to get to know each other. So that's my portrait photography. But we're here to talk about the link between the portrait photography and the landscape photography, being successful in both. But what is success when we talk about portrait photography? Let's just concentrate on that just for a little bit longer. What is success when you're talking about portrait photography? Is it composition? Is it sharpness? Is it the lighting? Is it the expression? Or is it a combination of all of it or, and I'm only just kind of, I'm playing devil's advocate here, I'll throw this out to you, is it just when, let's say, a, a relative sees the picture that you've taken of that person, when they go, oh, that is so them. That is just so them. Oh, I love it. You've really captured them. Is that success more than composition, lighting, whatever? That might sound really strange to say that, but I remember going back a few years ago now when I was over in the Netherlands, I was doing a talk at a show called the Professional Imaging Show, which I highly recommend you go to when we're able, you know, get these things back up and running. But I remember coming off the stage and this guy's come round to me at the end of it. And he has then kind of said, he was all crying, all, was a, little, all a little bit upset. And he sort of said that he was really upset because the last picture he ever took of his dad was out of focus. And I understand why he was upset, but I said, look, when you look at that picture that you have taken, which isn't perfectly sharp and what have you, what do you see in your head? Do you see the picture of your dad blurred or do you see your dad? And he said, well, I see my dad. And that's how it should be. That to me is a successful portrait. And yes, I know all the, the technical stuff is obviously what we want, but ultimately we want to have a reaction. So what about landscape photography then? What is success when we talk about landscape photography? Is it lighting? Is it composition? Well, of course, that's what we want, isn't it? We want to take a great landscape photo, but is it us remembering everything about where we were? Is it all about the vista, seeing the whole scene and what have you? Is that what the success is as a landscape photographer? So let me just dive onto this picture and have this next picture here, because back in 2018, this is when I 
kind of tried my hand at landscape photography. This is when I decided I was going to do a landscape photography project purely for me, for nobody else, but for my benefit. And this is a picture that I took, and I was shown this location by two very good friends of mine, Ian Munro and Anthony Carruthers. And I know that Anthony's in the actual chat, I believe, as well. So hello, Anthony, if you can hear me. But this picture here, uh, I thought this is what landscape photography was all about. I thought landscape photography was about the vista, the big scene. All right. Uh, and to be honest with you, I kind of, you know, I got really early to do the picture. I enjoyed being there, but I was really focused on getting what I thought was a landscape photograph. And to be honest, now I look at this picture, I know for definite I was running before I could walk when it came to landscapes. I thought it was all about the big picture and it's it's OK. It's nothing special. It's, it's definitely one for me, never for a portfolio. So what have I learned then over the last few weeks now that I am out there, now that I'm kind of had my hand forced to get out there and do these landscapes because of lockdowns and because I can't get my camera in front of a veteran or anybody really, I am now had my hand forced to get out there and do the landscapes. So what now have I learned in the last, I don't know, five or six weeks since I've been doing it? Well, I'm trying to be clever with you today because what I've actually done is come up with something I'm calling the Sir principle. And these are three distinct points that I have kind of identified that are helping me to improve with my landscape photography. Now, this you might hear, um, hear these three points and go, mm, not really me. Um, so I'm not marketing as three points for success when it comes to landscape. I am way too soon into this landscape journey to even start to say, this is how you can be successful in it. And that is definitely not what I'm doing. But what I'm doing is trying to show you what I think are the three things that I've learned and I have always in my mind now to help me improve. All right, so let me just go through these. The first one in this Sir principle is to think small. Now, that, again, sounds bizarre. Ordinarily, we're told think big. You know what I mean? Don't limit yourself, think big. But let, let me explain. When it comes to thinking small, what I'm talking about is, you remember the picture from Wales where I thought I had to photograph it, the whole thing in front of me? I was trying to capture the whole, the big thing in front of me. It's not really that. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna dive out, I'm gonna show you a very small segment of a video that I did a few weeks ago, uh, where you can kind of see that I was a little bit overwhelmed when it comes to um, what was what I was presented with in front of me. So bear with me, I'm gonna get this video up for you now. All right, so we'll go for that video there. And we'll play the video. All right, so this is my second trip out to try and improve myself as a landscape photographer. And I decided to come to a place called Heartland Key on the North Devon coast. Um, I just don't know where to begin. Now, this is a beautiful place. There is no denying it. I mean, when you first come up here, it's quite overwhelming. I mean, the landscape is just incredible. But for me, wanting to start out as a landscape photographer, I don't know really if I'm maybe trying to run before I can walk because there just seems too much to choose from, too many places. I found myself walking around, climbing up stuff, which is pretty dangerous around here. Uh, but I just don't know where to, where to start. It's, this is one of the first things probably that I've learned now, massive difference between landscape photography 
and portrait photography is that as a portrait photographer, which is what I do primarily, I know what I'm going to get by the end of the shoot. In fact, I know what I'm going to get before the shoot even starts. I can control everything. Whereas here, you can kind of turn up, you can do your recce's and try to get the best composition. But even with all the best, you know, planning and prep that you could do, you're still dependent on mother nature uh, behaving. So yeah, it's gonna be very much hit and miss. And I guess that's pretty much where every single one of you who's a landscape photographer is gonna kind of say, it's really a, no matter how much you plan, you just don't know if you're gonna get a result. All right, so that was my uh, first kind of t attempt, really, if you like, at doing the, the landscapes. And you can probably tell from that, I was, I was completely overwhelmed. I really was. I didn't know where to go. Do you know what I mean? There was just too much. I was like a kid in a sweet shop, really know not what sweet to pick. Um, but I did enjoy it. You know, it was, it was good. I was pushing myself to get out there. But look at the picture on screen now. This is this is what I thought I had to do. This is what I thought I was there for if I wanted to do landscape photography. And I'll be honest with you, I've spent more time retouching this picture than actually seeing this image, editing it, oh, sorry, uh, getting down, putting the camera there, doing the settings, everything. I spent more time editing, trying to get something out of it than actually getting it in camera. And, you know, I kind of looked through lots of books on landscape photography where they have these big rocks in the foreground and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, well, I've got to do that. Um, and that's what I ended up with. And, you know, you've got to start somewhere. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, I shouldn't compare to other people. We do though, don't we? We do compare ourselves to other people. But, you know, this is a starting point. And my idea of doing this YouTube video series was to just show everything, warts and all, the successes, the failures, the happy accidents. But in my attempt to get at least something from this whole venture, I also thought, well, I'll tell you what, I'll convert it to black and white. That's always a winner. But it isn't. You can see from this picture here, it isn't, it's nothing. Do you know what I mean? However, I'm glad I've done it because each time I'm going out, I'm learning something, just like with the portraits. Rather than me sitting at home in a book, uh, re re reading a book rather, and, and watching loads and loads of videos and stuff, getting out there in the field, getting your hands dirty is where you learn. And that's certainly where I'm learning at the moment with this landscape stuff. So the first thing I wanted to kind of, kind of get over in this uh, principle was thinking small. So hopefully that's making sense. Now, with that whole idea of thinking small, we'll look at the next point of the Sir Principle. Let me just dive over to it. So the next point of the Sir Principle is immerse. So we've got think small is the S, the S for small, and I is for immerse. Now, what do I mean by immerse? This is where I think is that real overlap now with my portrait photography and how that's improved and landscape photography. Um, because this is where you're really enjoying where you are. Per perfect example for me is two good friends of mine. I've mentioned them already, actually. Ian Munro, Anthony Crothers. Now, Ian Munro, if you do not know Ian Munro, I highly recommend you, ch you check him out. M-U-N-R-O is how you spell his surname. Uh, a fantastic conceptual photographer. His imagination is off the scale. And how he's able to capture that imagination into a still image blows me away. It's such good fun to watch it. However, when he first started out, he was a landscape photographer. And Ian is somebody who is, he's a proper outdoor person. He loves the outdoors, going hiking across the Brecon Beacons, going all over the place. And when he was doing his landscape photography, that's exactly, it was like a marriage made in heaven. You know, an outdoor person doing landscapes. It doesn't get better than that. But what Ian admitted to me a few weeks ago was that he became so fixated on getting the image that he kind of missed everything that was with him. Now, of course, he's there because he's, he's, he's looking at a certain part of the scene where he's, where he's at. But the journey there, everything else outside of his camera, everything else apart from you know, what he could see down, down the, through the lens was almost being ignored. So he was, he was missing 
the beauty of it, if you like, and I can't believe I'm even talking like this. I never believed I'd, I'd have these words like beauty and passion, and but but it is. This is what the landscape photography is doing for me. He uh, he was missing it all. Another one, Anthony Crudders. He said he went on holiday, and he's gone with his camera on his own, a bit of a break. He'd gone for a walk, and he's walking over the dunes and through these over these styles and getting to the where he wanted on this particular beach to do a picture and he did the picture and he's quite happy with it however me and Anthony were talking the other day and he says he's going to have to go back because the journey that he walked to get to the beach he went over beautiful wooden styles in fields when there's the heather and all, all that kind of stuff which would make amazing photographs but he was just so fixated on getting to that one point he hadn't immersed himself into that environment. Does that make sense? I, don't know. I hope it does. Um, so here's, here's my attempt at being wise or, or wordy. Um, landscape photography is a journey, not a destination. That's not, that's not my saying. I haven't come up with that. I'm just sure I've heard that before. But I guess as well, we could kind of say that photography, uh, portrait photography is also a journey. It's not a destination. Because I know for a fact that when I was photographing these World War II veterans, which I will be picking up on again once we're able to, once we're safe to do. If I hadn't, if I hadn't taken the focus off the end result, like Ian was, you know, with the picture, I wouldn't have been able to develop that relationship with the person in front of the camera to really capture them. It's exactly the same with the landscape photography. Now, when I sort of realised that, and I started started then to realise landscape photography isn't about the big vista which if you're kind of trying to be you know do landscapes can put a lot of stress and pressure on you to come back with a result if you can kind of accept that it isn't just the big thing it can also be the smaller things that's when it can really change and that's how it really changed for me so for example this picture here is one that i did when i literally was just there in this woodland area near to where I live and just completely and utterly relaxed, enjoying where I was, got there nice and early. I was amongst the, you know, in the, amongst the trees and stuff while the morning was waking up, the sun was breaking through the, the tree canopy, the birds were singing, it was just fantastic. I was enjoying the time there like I would enjoy the time with a person that I was photographing. It was just wonderful. And I wasn't even looking for the picture and it just kind of happened. These things just, I just, you know, just by slowing down, relaxing, immersing myself, I started to notice stuff. So I want to show you another little video now. I think that's the video just here. So let me just come out of here. I'll turn off my cell. <laughs> then I will show the video. We're going to go to this little video here, which is one, uh, which kind of talks about um, what happened basically when I was there. So again, just a few minutes to watch this little video. So in this video, I want to show you something that happened yesterday. I actually got a picture I didn't expect and the way it happened, I think is going to make a huge difference to my landscape photography journey. So yesterday morning, I headed out nice and early to catch the early morning sunrise. I'd already planned where I was going to go and I knew exactly the direction in which the sun was going to be coming up. So it was just great to get out and just have a really leisurely meander around a local forest. It was so incredibly relaxing. I kept my camera in my bag, not walking around with it in my hands, just hoping to pounce on something that could be a photograph but instead just kept it in my bag as I just walked around. Now, even though I'd planned it to the point that I knew where to go and what time to go, I guess in the back of my mind, I still was thinking I'd end up getting a picture. So although I was feeling relaxed, I also felt there was a little bit of me that was also 
searching. I just couldn't seem to release that searching for a photograph. Eventually, I'd gone all the way around the track that I'd intended, and I was pretty much back to where I started. But before I went back to the car, I thought I'd just kind of cut across and go into an area of the forest where there's a wonderful canopy above and just grab a coffee and just stop, stand still, and take it all in. And that's exactly where you join me now. I just literally got to this particular point. There was, there was some uh, sun coming through the trees as it was rising in that kind of direction. Light was coming through the trees and I thought I'd get the shot, but I kind of missed it. Didn't have everything ready, so that kind of shot went to nothing. So I thought I'd just park up in this place here, put my bag down and just grab a coffee. Uh, and I guess it was kind of while I was in that state of mind, which was not really thinking about photography, just enjoying the moment. I was kind of just standing here, listening to the birds, kind of listening to the morning wake up. There's all the sounds that you get in the forest of all the little creatures as they're kind of moving around. You can hear the odd break of a branch or the, the sound of a bird singing in the distance, the trees kind of whistling and, um, well, not whistling, but rustling, rustling in the breeze. It was just so, so peaceful. And I think that really did kind of just just change everything for me because before now even though on this particular trip I'd come out with the intention of being relaxed okay I'd kind of put into my mindset taken all the advice that I'd gotten off everybody that had so kindly commented and emailed and um, just come here to enjoy it have a walk around and really really enjoy it but when I got here having the coffee my mind's just kind of just drifted off enjoying being here photography was kind of forgot about then I'm just looking around, just taking it all in, and that's when I notice the tree. All right, so uh, let me just, in fact, I'm gonna stop showing my, uh, no, you can see me, hope you can see me. Right, so that video there obviously kind of highlights the fact that how the benefit to me uh, by just slowing down made it made a massive difference. Now. Uh, where are we now? We're kind of halfway through at the moment. I've got so much more I want to show you, editing, printing and stuff. But I'll just kind of dive in to say, if you've got any questions at all uh, or any advice, tips, tricks, techniques, anything that you've learned, because you take landscape photographs, get them in the chat. I'd really appreciate it. And obviously, if you've got any questions about any kit that I'm using, why I'm using it, because I've actually made a decision now that I'm only going to use a 70 to 200 mil lens because I found that having too many lenses to choose from was stressing me out. It was causing too much confusion. So I thought, right, I'll stick with one lens. Again, like I did when it comes to portrait photography, I chose to use the 85 mil lens for my close-up portraits and nothing else. That seemed to help as well. So I'm thinking maybe the same approach with my uh, landscapes. All right, okay. Now I have got another short video. That's This will be the last video I wanna show you, but this kind of, to me, really highlights the feeling that I'm looking for when I'm out there, all right? Rather than me just going out there, really thinking, right, I've got to get a picture by relaxing. I want to try and get myself in a state of mind where I'm just completely at, at ease with where I am. Again, I can't believe I'm even talking like this when it comes to doing, doing photographs. But I'm going to show you a short clip from a TV program. And it's actually a program called Gone Fishing in the UK it's with two guys. Paul Whitehouse and Bob Mortimer. And if you don't know who they are, they're comedians, they're TV personalities. They've also done some acting. Incredible. And this program is called Gone Fishing when they're going out. But just watch what happens at the end of this short clip to Paul Whitehouse when he's watching this, when he's out there. So let me just find this video for you and then uh, we'll carry on. Yes! Moo! Mm. Oh! Oh! Po! You're over there! Yeah! 
What are you doing? I'm doing you our birthday party. <laughs> Can you see? Fireworks, are you sure that this is a responsible behaviour? Yes, because they're near a cake. Oh, right. That's the rule, is it? Happy birthday. Well, thank you very much. Is it heart healthy? No, but it's just once a year, Paul, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. Oh, my God! Yes, I've been to Lidl. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Oh! <laughs> Cheers, we good. That's and the fish. trout are rising, the mayfly are rising. Look at the light. Bob, look at the light. Yeah. Look at that. They're amazing, isn't it? And there's one final thing. Sorry, I am actually just... Just the, the sheer beauty of that is just sort of... Um, is the word enraptured? Are you enraptured? Yeah, I am. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Paul. Good. How good is that? When you can see Paul's reaction to that particular uh, scene there in front of him. Just, just wonderful. And that's what I want. Now, I am going to kind of um, show you something else. I'm going to show you this, but before we move on, you know what I said about kind of slowing down, enjoying it, and, and looking at the, uh, um, the scene around you? There was a guy, I, when I did that video that said, I suck at landscape photography, this guy posted a comment to me, and I just want to read what that comment was. And this was when I did a, a thing last week, I think it was, for the Kelvin One community. Uh, and I said I wasn't very good at landscapes. He's put, so what did you do? You did a portrait of a beautiful and striking tree. How did you do it? You spent time with it, like walking into the house without all your equipment and having some coffee, but this time with the moss and the leaves on the tree, and then settled in and used your portrait, ex portrait experience to take portraits of them. And I just thought, because I didn't realize at first that that's kind of what I'd done, but do you know what? He's right. By me slowing down, absorbing, and just doing what I do when I take portraits of just getting to know the person, in this case, getting to know where I am, it made a huge difference to me, all right? Right, let me just carry on with the uh, the slides that I wanna show you here. So I'm gonna uh, stop showing the video and we'll dive over to my main screen, screen two, and we'll dive into there, there we go, cool. All right, so the next thing I wanted to kind of say, was again by me absorbing myself or immersing myself rather in the environment I also realized that uh, looking not just looking out but looking down and looking up is making a huge difference and I guess to so many of you out there this is just such obvious stuff but to me it wasn't it really really wasn't but I wasn't going to do any of this until I actually slowed down all right so uh, the next thing Repeat. This is the final part of the three the three point principle, this sir principle. So we're talking now about repeat. Now let me just show you this portrait here of a World War II veteran, David Edwards. Wonderful, wonderful man who, again, sadly we lost. This this past 12 months has been horrific for veterans. They've really struggled. So we lost David. But this was the first portrait that I ever did of David. And I've actually never shown this portrait up until this very moment. So you're the first people to see this because this one's been on my hard drive and never seen the light of day. So we're talking about repeat. I'm gonna dive back into the portrait world just for a second and just kind of ask you, again, uh, just kind of just throwing it out there for you to think about this. If you could, if you look at portraits that maybe some of you have done, okay, if you could go back to photograph that person again, what would you do different? Would you do it different? Would you now know something about them that would maybe change the way you photograph them? Would you maybe position them differently? I don't know. Was it, is there some? If you could have the chance to go and do that photograph again, would you? Because that's exactly what I did with David. I went. I drove to Wales to photograph David. This is what I got. And I, I kind of just missed why I, what I was also wanting to do. Because I kind of rushed it, maybe, I missed the most important thing. And for me, that was also to include his medals, which you can see now at this angle. You can't really see them. So I rang them. I rang David and his wife, Diane. I rang them when I, was, when I got back home that very same day. And I said, can I come back tomorrow? Can I come and do the portrait again tomorrow? And they were like, yeah, they, were just, they are just lovely, lovely people. But like I said, unfortunately, we've lost David. So number one, you can see on screen, is the first picture. Then going back, repeating what I'd done to go and see David again, just like me going back to that forest area and 
getting to know it, seeing things different, noticing something different about it. I then did a different portrait of David. And number two is the picture that has been used on the website and also been shown at the exhibition. So repeating part of this whole process is massively important. We don't just, you know, I would, I would kind of hazard a guess that any of you out there are landscape photographers, if you think of some of the most amazing pictures that you've taken that you're really happy with, was it the very first and last time you ever went to that place? Or is it somewhere that you'd been to maybe a few times to get to know it, get to know where the best places are, get to know where the sun sets, get to know all, everything about it before you really got what you wanted? If it's not, and it was your first shot, then you've got to contact me because I need to know your secrets. But I think pretty much it's a case if you have to repeat to go back. For example, I mean, also near me as well, for example, I'm, there's a tree near me uh, where we've moved to in Devon at the bottom of our garden. We've got this field and this tree, this wonderful trees in it. And this is a picture that I took the very first time. But I've kind of committed myself to keep taking pictures of this tree to see if I can improve. So I did this picture, changing my thought process. Do you see before I went wide? like I did with that picture in Wales, but now I've gone closer, changing to that 70 to 200. Oh, and by the way, Ricky, I know that you've posted to say about the 70 to 200, I think is a really good lens for using landscapes. Thank you. That's a, that's a kind of like a little pat on my back to say that I must be doing something right then if I'm making those kind of decisions. So thank you. Uh, then I also noticed it that it, the weather had changed, which obviously has a massive impact on landscape photography. The weather had changed a bit of, uh, bit of mist and whatever came down, so I went out yet again. So I'm going to keep doing this, just keep on doing this. This isn't a process that's going to end. I'm going to keep on going, seeing what I can get from this. But again, slowing down, immersing myself. I noticed uh, these mushroom and what have you as well. So, uh, no, sorry, toadstool, fungi, fungi. Um, so yeah, that's all kind of stuff there. I and mean, Anthony's actually just put a comment in. I'm going to read this out. Anthony's put, as well as David's uh, medals, I think you captured a better expression on the second time around. I guess that proves the point. Yeah, Anthony, yeah, you're dead right. It, it, you know, it's, it's great that you pick up on that, but I think this whole process of, you know, thinking small, immersing yourself in it, and then repeating. There was, maybe I didn't even know that I'd noticed something more about David, which enabled me to capture that, that expression. I really don't know, but there's such an overlap when it comes to portraits and landscapes, as I see it, it really, really is. All right, okay, so just to show you a couple of the pictures that I've done recently by going back to this repeat, because I also want to uh, show you a little bit of editing, and I also want to do a print, a print that I've not done yet. So you're gonna be the first people to see it, whether it fails or not. Um, okay, right, so here's, here's one picture here you can see where I, again, went out nice and early in the morning, really enjoying where I was. I kind of took the camera bag and went for a, just a gentle stroll, enjoying being there, really enjoying being there, the morning waking up and just seeing what happened while I was there. And I just happened to see this scene as I was walking away. And it's, you know, I'm nowhere near where I want to be when it comes to landscapes, but my whole feeling towards it has really changed. And that woodland area that you would have seen on one of the videos there where I was panning around, that I said I was having a coffee and just relaxing, bit of mist on one morning, so I went up and I actually captured this one, which I was kind of really pleased about. So um, that is my Sir principle, if you like. So thinking small, immersing yourself in the environment enjoying it rather than just thinking about or looking straight through the camera enjoying where you are this is the great thing i think about landscape photography is that you don't i guess if you don't do it for a living all right which i don't portraits is what i do is it really the end of the world if you don't come back with a picture is it really that bad is it really that you know is it is it is that disaster i'm going to say no because Let's face it, it's been quite challenging for us all since March of last year, restrictions. And I think maybe it's fair to say that all of us have started to realise the things that we maybe took for granted before, now that we can't have them, the freedom to go out and just enjoy being with people or being in certain places. So with landscape photography, if I'm going out there and I don't get a picture, it's still good because I've kind of been out there and enjoyed it and just you know got some fresh air in my lungs and what have you, all right? Uh, it's great to see there's some questions coming through. I know that uh, Alexandra, who's kind of helping with all the technicality side of things with this, I know she's gonna throw some in, so we will answer some of those questions. I've also got some code to give you right at the end of very, at the end as well. So I hope that kind of makes sense with the, the Sir principle. Don't go off, you know, don't, oh yeah, that Sir principle was, you know, I've made it up. It's a way of me remembering those three points so I don't 
go out there and try to get a picture every single time. But talking of pictures, we can't always get out there and take pictures. There's all kinds of reasons maybe why we can't get out. I know that when I've posted sometimes about the weather being bad, some people have said, well, if the weather's bad, that's the perfect time to get out there. Maybe not all the time, all right? So, but I am kind of keeping active by having the tools in my hands. So I'm doing stuff indoors. So, you know, this is a flower. So it's kind of, it's a loose link with landscapes. So I'm kind of, that's why I brought, I brought this in. But getting indoors and just doing stuff like this as well is helping up here. You know, it's helping keep creative, keep tools in your hands. Um, I'm enjoying doing this. But the background you can see just here, this is where I photographed it. Uh, using the camera on a tripod, uh, 70 to 200, um, Ricky, so you'll be pleased I use that one. Uh, shooting tethered, I always shoot tethered, just really enjoying it. And I actually did light this one artificially as well, so you can see that just there. But let me dive, uh, I'm going to come out of this for the moment. I'm going to come out of there, and what I am going to do is um, bring up Lightroom. So I'm hoping, that now, me and uh, Alexander we were kind of testing this before you know we started to go live. I know there was a little bit of a lag, so I don't know if there's a little bit of a lag at the moment, obviously. Uh, but if there is, just bear with me. Uh, I want to just show you just a couple of things. Perfect. All right, I think oh, we've just had it there, Lumesca. They've just said they can see everything. So what I was going to do was while we're here, and this is really risking it, but I thought we'd just do a quick print. So one thing I have done, in fact, let me just show you here all the images that I'm doing during this lockdown period. Uh, and I've done other projects since March of last year, but the, the landscape picture, I'm doing, I'm printing everything. Um, printing everything, that's really, for me, it's proving to be really beneficial. Because I know that a friend of mine, Katrina Eisman, she says, the truth is revealed when you do a print. All right, so I'm doing, I'm doing prints. So what I thought we'd do while we're here, because I want to do this and I want to show you a little bit of editing as well, is just show you doing a print. So you can see Lightroom on the moment. I'll just take me off screen so you can probably see all of it there. So we're in Lightroom at the moment. We're in the develop module. This is the pitch that I do, square crop. Uh, so I'm going for like a one by one ratio. And over on the right hand side, you can see now the, the print module. So we come down to uh, here, the color management, and you can see hopefully, again, I don't know how clear this is coming streaming to you, but the paper I'm using here, I'm choosing this one called, um, FB Pearl, and that's by Permagen. In fact, let me just put my camera just back on for a second. This is uh, the paper I'm using by Permagen, FB Pearl 300, which I'm really liking for these landscapes. Uh, so that's what I'm, uh, what I'm gonna be using just there. So you can see I've got the profile. I'll talk about that in a moment, how I've actually done that, because that's really important. One of the things that used to really be a pain for me when I was printing was that I could never get my images in print to look anything like they did on the screen. I've now sorted that. Uh, so we can talk about how to do that maybe later on or maybe in, uh, in the email that we'll get out to you. But uh, let's just quickly have a look in Lightroom here. So we're gonna go for using this particular profile for this paper. So I'm gonna click on printer to bring up the print dialog box. And this is where I just check a few things before we print. And the first one here is color matching. And you see, because we are using a profile what I don't want is for the printer to start to think it knows how it should print. So I'm gonna say, look, we've got a profile, this is what you need to do. So you can see here, color matching is completely grayed out. So which means all the color matching is being done by the profile. The profile is telling the printer, look, this is what you need to do to make Glenn's picture look like it should do. So that's fine. The other thing is quality and media. Now you can see in here, it says uh, media type, Photo Paper Pro Platinum. And you can see there's all kinds of different options in here. Now, the reason I'm choosing that particular paper there, if I just turn my, my uh, camera back on, is within every kind of pack of paper you get, you'll get like a little reference guide. And that will say to you, if you're using a, a Canon printer or an Epson printer or whatever, this is the equivalent setting you need to use or paper you need to choose within your software to get the best results. So I'm using FB Pearl, and it says to me here, I've got to use Photo Paper Pro Platinum to get the best result, all right? So that's there, cool. So once we've done that, I'm now gonna put the paper in the printer, like so, and if it doesn't work, let's just forget it never happened. <laughs> and then, uh, so Photo Paper Pro, we'll go for high, and we'll click on print. 
Right, let's just leave that to do its thing. So hopefully we're going to get some noise coming through from the printer in a moment. It's preparing the job. Right, cool. So what I want to do now then is dive into, let's just get that minimized. Let's just bring up uh, Photoshop because what I wanted to do was just show you a uh, quick bit of editing on this picture here. This is the tree picture. Uh, cool. All right. So this, let's just delete that just there. That's the kind of edited in Lightroom version of the picture. You can see just a little bit of light where the sun was kind of coming through the trees. Uh, and that will strike in the left hand side of the tree. We can see this area here is in shadow. But I want to show you how I gave it a bit of a glow. And everybody who's into landscapes, I'm sure, has heard of the Orton effect. And there's so many different ways you can do the Orton effect. But let me just show you one of those ways that you can particularly do it. All right. So this is how we're going to do so the first thing, I am going to create a duplicate of that particular image in the layers panel, uh, layers panel. So you can see there's two there now. Now I'm using a Sony A7R4, which I believe is 61 megapixels. Now that's important to remember because now what I'll do is go to the filter menu and choose blur and Gaussian blur. And the amount of Gaussian blur that I'm putting in is going to be 60 because whatever my resolution pretty much of my camera is what I'll put in the blur. So if your camera is a 30 or a 40 or 50 megapixels, put the equivalent amount of blur in there. So then we'll click OK. Then all I will do is go to the uh, blend modes of that particular layer and change it to soft light. And already you can see how much of a darker but dreamier kind of glow it's giving. You can even then come in and change the opacity to control how uh, you want that to, to look. Now, one extra little thing you could also do once you've got it there and you're quite happy with that particular autumn effect, so you can see it off and on. It's a variation of the autumn effect, really. We can then go to the channels tab. Now, this is where we've got the RGB, which is the full composite of the red, green and blue channels. This is what we see now. The RGB is what you can see on screen. If I hold down my command key on a Mac or control key on a PC or you know Windows machine and click down on the thumbnail of that RGB channel, you'll see there's a few little speckles starting to appear. And basically what I've done there is loaded the highlight areas of that particular image. So now I go back to the layers panel and I'll hold down the command or control key and then press J to put a copy of that selected area all onto its own layer. And you can see if I just turn it off and on, you can see that just a little bit of it, you can see it around the screen just there. Now look what happens if I now change the uh, blend mode of this particular one here to screen. So now this is turning off and on, off and on. So that's then bringing up a bit more brightness in those highlighty areas. That's just that one little thing I wanted to show you there. All righty, let's just uh, have a quick look, see what else we've got in the, oh, here we go. Right, let me show you this, let's just close that down. And we'll bring back up my uh, thing just here and hopefully you can see me and you should now see a picture of my uh, desktop to give you an idea of what it is. So this is my typical setup. This is where I am sitting right now. So I've got my Mac, which I'm using and I plug in my second monitor. Now the monitor I'm using, I get asked about this quite a lot, is uh, it's a 32 inch monitor. So it's nice and big. Uh, it's a BenQ monitor. And I, although I do do stuff with BenQ, uh, I used to use their monitors before I was even connected with them in any way, shape or form. So I'm very much somebody, those of you who um, kind of uh, maybe followed me for a while, I'm hoping that you realise I'm somebody who's built a reputation on trust. And if I don't like something, I'll tell you. Do you know what I mean? I don't just kind of just use it for the sake of using it. It's got to be fit for purpose is the term I'm looking for. But this is the monitor that I'm using here. This 32 is the SW321C. And I can show you what that looks like on this slide here. What I love about this is the fact that it's a the screen has got no shine to it. It's a very matte finish to the actual um, image. So uh, when you're looking at the actual picture, on the screen because it's not got any kind of reflections on it because it's a matte screen you see a real representation of it no matter what angle really you're looking at it so i love it for that uh, and i think it's 99 percent adobe rgb as well so it's, it's a i love it i love that monitor i really do and you'll probably see from the actual picture of my desktop i don't use it now with the lens hood 
because I've got a very consistent environment lit in this particular room. All right, so that's that one there. So BenQ, that's the monitor I use. I always get asked about it, so I thought I'd tell you. I mentioned about profiling my papers. Um, so I mentioned about the fact that, you know, you choose the paper that you want. Um, now this gadget here, this is called the I1 Studio. Because um, one thing you always get told when you're looking to do printing is everyone says that the only thing you have to do is uh, calibrate your monitor and then go and get some profiles from the paper manufacturer. And I did that years ago, never ever worked. Now, over recent years, I started to do it again, look into it. So now I use this gadget here, which will calibrate my screen, but also allows me to create a profile of my paper. All right, so this is like a little case that you get with it, which allows you to hang it over your monitor so that it can take the readings and, and create a nice, you know, calibrate your screen correctly. And you can also do test prints with these kind of colored grids, which you then basically run this device over uh, and it'll know, ah, right. So if you want that to be red, that's what it needs to be like. And if you want it green, that's what it needs to be right. So it creates a profile to then tell the printer how to behave when it prints one of my images. I think I just heard it finished. So we'll have a look at that in just a second. In fact, let's have a look at that now, shall we? Let me stop showing my screen. And hopefully you should see me. Uh, let's just come out of Keynote. You should see me full screen. So if I can get a, uh, oh yeah, and that's made by Xrite as well, by the way, the i1 Studio. So uh, it says here I'm a little bit pixelated. This could be working to my advantage now because this will be the first time this has been printed. Um, so let's have a look. Oh, there you go. Look at that. I don't know how this is going to show up, but look, I am chuffed to bits with that. I am really happy. So yeah, it's a little bit pixelated, unfortunately, but you're going to have to trust me now. <laughs> I'll, in fact, if you follow me on social media, I'll give you the details of that. I'll do a picture of this and put it on there so you can see what I mean. But yeah, really, really happy with that. Very happy. Excellent. So yeah, the printing side of things has been well and truly sorted. Right. So let me just uh, show you just a couple of extra things before we wrap up. And then we'll do some questions as well. So let's just uh, show my screen again. Let's just dive out of there and we'll bring this up. Because I want to make sure that you get these. I mentioned um, this some codes for you. Let me just get these out of the way for you first of all. Uh, like I said at the start, massive thank you to people at BenQ and to Xright for kind of hosting this first ever landscape uh, webinar for me. Never done it before. Uh, there's two codes there which are valid. It says at the bottom they're valid until the 25th of Feb. Xright-10, which will give you 10% off any Xright product like the i1 Studio. Uh, there's other different calibrators as well you can get the i1 profile for a profile for doing your monitors as well gets you 10 percent off that if you go to wexphotovideo.com and then benq5 will give you five percent off benq products as well benq monitors and stuff within there uh, so that's that uh, and that's obviously from wex and you can see the uh, wex website at the bottom massive thanks for them for kind of helping us to put all this together as well so it's wexphotovideo.com Huge thanks to them for kind of collaborating with everybody to get this on. Uh, and just before we go to the questions, these are my details. Um, if you don't want to type them details out, just put your phone over the QR code and that'll get that all up there for you as well. All right, so that's that. But let's now have a look. I think there's going to be some, uh, possibly some questions. Let's put my uh, camera back on. Let's have a look here. So uh, question from Marianne says, what printer are you using and what size do you print in? Okay, good. I, you know, I forgot to mention that completely there. So thank you, Marianne. Uh, that printer that you see just here, and I love this printer, is a Canon Pixmar Pro 10S. It's a 10 ink system. It's an A3 Plus printer. Uh, and I don't generally print A3 Plus. It's always, I always do it like an A3. And you can see there's no um, kind of set crop that I do. I tend to crop the images that works best for them. And then I do them on the, on the on the print. So you can see, hopefully, again, I don't know how pixelated this is, but you can see there, that's the kind of border on that particular print there. So Canon Pixmar Pro 10S, it's been around for quite a while, but it is a fab, fab printer. I absolutely love it. Uh, Keith has said, have you experimented with focus stacking for landscaping? Keith, yes, yes, I have. And I can't remember which image it was now, but I have. And I've done focus stacking before, Keith, if you've never seen my stuff, if you if you kind of go onto the blog, you'll see what I was doing back in March of last year, March and April. I did a uh, model aircraft making airfix model kind of project, and I was using focus stacking for that. 
it is brilliant. So yeah, I, I'm totally with you on that. Focus stacking is definitely the way forward. I love it. I'm going to do hopefully do more of that when we can get further afield. So thank you. Um, could you put the slide up? We always have a look here. Let's just go back in. Let me just show you this uh, slide again. So I'm going to show my slide just so that you don't forget these, just so that you've got them. Not forgetting that they are valid until the 25th of February. Uh, oh, Canon Pix. Oh, right. Uh, Marianne, it's the Canon Pixmar, which is P-I-X-M-A, and then Pro 10-S, S for Sierra, Canon Pixmar Pro 10S. I'm guessing that's my accent that's not making it so clear. There you go. Uh, Leon has said, what size border or extra canvas pixels, presumably, did you put around these photos in pixel size? Um, do you know there's no exact amount that I've put in there, uh, Leon, because basically on these uh, papers here, certainly on some of the other ones, um, when you're using a fine art paper, you are very controlled with this particular printer, what you're doing. It has to have like a 30, um, I guess it's 30 mil kind of border to allow for the fact that the paper can warp a little bit. So you don't want to get your, your borders kind of warping. But I, I, honest answer, I have no idea. When it comes to doing the prints, I have no idea. Like this one here, I have no idea what the actual length of that one is on the long edge. Sometimes, like the the, the daffodil one that I've just done, this one here I know is a square crop, but it's 10.17 inches by 10.17 inches. I do it to what it just looks good at, and I know that I want it a little bit on the side. Um, and generally, I only leave a little bit on the side there, because if I do get these framed, I know that my framer likes to have a little bit of room so that he can use that for putting the frame around it as well. Uh, Morris has put focus stacking. What program do you use? Photoshop, Helicon, or Zurini? Okay, easy answer to that one because I've never heard of the other two. Uh, Photoshop. <laughs> that's uh, Morris. That's what I've kind of been brought up in. I used to be a you know full time retoucher. So uh, when it comes to uh, using Photoshop, that's generally my kind of go to kind of way for it. However, I'm going to make a note of those two bits of uh, software that you mentioned there and see if we can have a look at those because it's always always good to look at other stuff. Um, Gordon, what size do you save your images at before or after editing ready for printing? Good question. Yeah, good question. Gordon, what I, one thing I will say about that is I um, I always save the full-sized image. I never downscale them. I always save every single layer for every single image that I do. Um, and sometimes they go above Photoshop's limit, so you have to, I think it's been increased now to four gigabyte limit, I believe. So then you have to change the format you save it in, because sometimes if you go to save it and it's over that size limit, it'll go all the way through to the very end. And then Photoshop will say, sorry, I can't save that to then send back to Lightroom. So you have to save the format in what's called .psb, which is Photoshop big format, and then it'll send it over. Um, I keep getting someone asking about your background. Alexander, you're gonna have to confirm what you mean by my background. Is that, <laughs> if we're talking the background of the veterans port, oh, the background on here, if it's the background in my, <laughs> if that's the background in my room, uh, that is, it's, uh, here you go, it's, these people are getting promoted for no, it's a company called Lick, as in Lick, L-I-C-K, and uh, we found them online, great, and they make paper, uh, paint, and it's, they've got one of two greys, and we're the darker grey. That's their like a darker grey. So there you go. That was random, wasn't it? That was random. Uh, and Louise, do you actually focus bracketing rather than focus stacking, which is only in camera? Helicon focus is good. Okay. Um, okay. So if I, I think I kind of know what you mean there, but if I tell you my process, if I'm doing a, um, a landscape, I kind of manually adjust where the focus is to the foreground, take the shot, move it up again, middle ground, take it up, move it up, and take it to show three particular shots there. And because I'm using a Sony and I can actually use the Sony imaging mobile app, I don't have to touch the camera to then change where the focus point is. And I can actually touch focus. So the hands off and it's nice and safe. Uh, Leon, thanks. But I was thinking of the smaller image borders on screenshots you showed. Oh, Leon, oh, sorry, mate. Uh, that's all been made in Keynote by uh, using the Apple Keynote and the option to say it says either create a line or a, a, a photo border. Just click on that and the default size is what I put it up at. We got two answers for the one question there, didn't you? <laughs> but um, where are we now? We're six o'clock. I think unless uh, Alexander puts, oh, they're asking me, David, try utilizing a monopod instead of a tripod. 
to relax and free yourself up. Yeah, totally, David. In fact, I'm, I'm going one further uh, because I'm using this 70 to 200. Uh, I know a guy called Nigel Danson. If you're into photography uh, landscapes, you'll know of Nigel. Uh, and he tends to use a lot of the 70 to 200 uh, handheld because you've got the image stabilization, stabilization as well. And that's a little bit more freedom. But I take on board what you're saying about the monopod, definitely. But I'm, I'm going to kind of get out there more, try and handheld, see what I can do with that as well. You know, it's not a disaster if I come back and they're blurry. I, I don't really care. It's just getting out there is the main thing for me. And if I come back with a picture I'm happy with, then bonus, absolute bonus. Uh, and from Joe, I found limiting my kit to one lens when I go out to shoot helps me frame a scene. I otherwise, totally with you, Joe, totally. Because I found myself going, oh, right, let's try this. I've got a 16 to 35. I've got a 24 70. I've got a 70 to 200. And it's just too much choice. It's just too much choice. And then I just kind of, you know, make my option. But if I stay right now, 70 to 200, that's what I'm going to stick with. If I can't do the picture I wanted to do with the 70 to 200, well, there you go. I'll have to go back another day with a different lens. But I'm, I'm really limiting my kit. And again, this is bringing it over my portrait time. I know that my portraits improved when I limited the lens choice that I gave myself. All right. Um, boom, 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 boom. Uh, Jack, when you send your photos to be printed by a professional lab, do you send them as a PSD, a TIFF, or a JPEG? It, it all depends. I, I tend to use um, TIFF when I'm sending them. A lot of times, Pro Labs, uh, like Digital Lab, is the one that I, I prefer for doing my um, my lab printing when they're bigger than what this thing can do. Uh, I send it to Digital Lab and I send it to them in a TIFF, okay, because it does retain more. Uh, certainly wouldn't send it to them in, in a JPEG, not to a Pro Lab. Uh, Louise, uh, we'll have a look at that. Uh, how do I find or delete older versions of photo? <laughs> um, that's probably a question for another time, all right, on the whole Photoshop. In fact, the, whoever posted that question there about the Photoshop and Lightroom updates, get in touch with me and I'll tell you how to do it, all right? Um, because you, you caught me off guard there, but just get in touch with me and I'll, I'll tell you how you can do it. So there you go. Um, I think that's it. That's all. I'm brilliant. Okay, so I listen to wrap this up. Don't forget there's those codes X right dash 10 and BenQ dash five. That'll give you the discounts till the 25th of Feb. And I just hope that everything that we've gone through today has made sense. I just wanted to show you that I believe as somebody who is a portrait photographer, that there really is an overlap with landscape photography. And that whole principle about not expecting to get the big vista looking for the smaller, take the stress off yourself, look for the smaller elements and maybe build up to the bigger ones. Immerse yourself in the environment, enjoy where you are. If you don't get a shot by the end of it, it's not the end of the world. We all need to get out more if we can, wherever we can at the moment, get some fresh air in your lungs, that is a positive. If we get a picture at the end of it, then double bonus. And then repeat, don't think you're gonna get the best shot. This is, I'm talking to myself now. Don't think you're gonna get the best shot you can the first time you go. It's gonna take plenty of times going back. How would you photograph that person again if you could go back, is what I'm saying, all right? So there you go. Thank you very much indeed. Um, catch you online. Check out my website, glynjewis.com, on social media at glynjewis. And thank you for joining me. Thank you for allowing me into your homes this evening. Take care, folks.